me uh, begin with what this state is going through, this enormous period of volatility. And I strongly believe that a recall should only be used for the traditional purposes of recall. Now, why is it there? It's there because if somebody gets into office, abuses the office with corruption, is guilty of gross moral turpitude, or suddenly has dramatic mental incompetence, the voters have recourse to remove that individual from office. And recall has always been part of the initiative process. We are a representative democracy, but people have a voice, and the initiative is part of it. But when Hiram Johnson put together this recall proposition in 1911, there were not paid signature gatherers. Today, anyone with a million dollars can pay a signature gatherer a dollar per signature. There are professional companies that do that, and they can virtually put something on the ballot. And that's what happened here. So now nine months after an election, after electing a governor subsequent, well subsequent to the energy crisis, for political reasons, the recall is going to be used to recall a sitting government who had, where none of the factors traditionally used for recall are present. I believe it's wrong. I believe it has a lot of unintended consequences. One, for example, is it is conceivable that the governor could be recalled with 49% of the vote, supporting him in office, but 51% saying, he must be recalled. And then a successor with 15% of the vote becomes governor at a critical time. Ladies and gentlemen, a vote margin is important because it gives you your mandate for change. Your votes are your instrument of power. People that you represent, whose values you take into a governor's office or into a United States Senate and affect public policy based on the power of that vote. And this individual won't have it. This individual will have a bare plurality and may well be facing an assembly and a Senate of a different political party. What kind of mandate for change is that really? And once recall becomes a concept which can be used to remove people from office because you don't like one thing or another that they did, then it will be used again and again and again that way. So my challenge is to say to the people of California, vote no on this recall. It, you can see as you listen to the dialogue, you don't hear solutions to the structural deficit. You don't hear solutions to a workman's compensation trust fund that by the end of next year will be a billion dollars in deficit. You don't hear real ideas coming forward. And that's why this short period is really not an adequate test. I've been in four statewide elections. I've been in 58 counties of this state. This state is different in various areas. And one has to be able to have knowledge of a high-tech community, of an agricultural community, of an environmental community, of ranchers, of cattlemen, of dairymen, um, of businessmen, of citizens, of the educational differences that we have in our schools. And you can't see that this individual, in this short of time, whomever it might be, would have those abilities or that knowledge. So my best advice to everyone is vote no on recall. Now, in my decade in the United States Senate, 
I don't believe I have ever seen a more precarious time for our country and our national security than today following 9-11. 9-11 opened America's eyes to the need for homeland security, to close loopholes in laws, and to take unprecedented ste steps to protect our people from a future and likely second attack. Back in Washington, and Ted mentioned that I'm the ranking member on the Terrorism and Technology Subcommittee and a member of the Select Committee on Intelligence, I've had opportunity on a daily basis to review intelligence briefs uh, that come in and also the opportunity to work to close loopholes in our nation's security. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we have passed uh, three major bills. The first is the USA Patriot Act. And that act addressed a lot of the fragmentation of anti-terrorism efforts. And the federal government, through this act, is now able to strengthen our ability to gather intelligence within the United States and it also to increase what's called the interoperability of intelligence between various agencies. What we found prior to 9-11 is all the agencies, defense intelligence, central intelligence, FBI, all were like stovepipes. They all kept their intelligence information to themselves. And what we really need is for that intelligence information to be exchanged. If intelligence information about the 19 hijackers had gone from CIA to state, it may well have been possible to have stopped some of them from coming into the country. Senator Kyle and I in the Judiciary Committee have worked hard on the Enhanced Border Security and Visa Entry Act, which allows immigration to screen visa applicants more effectively before they reach our shores. And this was a loophole-ridden system, and to some extent it still is today. But it is greatly improved. And there's an example of that that happened, and you all read it in the newspaper, where two Pakistani nationals were trying to come into Seattle, Tacoma, quite possibly having come in through the border of Canada. And they had one-way tickets that they had paid cash for. And when questioned by the ticket agent, they both left their tickets and disappeared. Now, whether these were operatives coming into the country or not, we do not yet know. But the point is that they were on a watch list and someone picked it up. Now we learn from that. We have to move faster even than that. But we will learn and we will do this. Also, I learned early on that, let's say there are three dozen deadly pathogens, uh, biologics, etc., and virtually anybody could obtain them. We have closed that loophole to establish strict security requirements to handle anthrax, plague, smallpox, and other pathogens. And we make it a crime for someone to possess these pathogens by anyone that is not registered with the Department of Health and Human Services. And finally, we have created a massive Department of Homeland Security, bringing 22 federal agencies together under one authority to be able to set priorities, to strategize in a different way. This is a monumental undertaking, and it's going to take some time before it's fully operational and efficient and, I might say, adequately funded. Given its population, California, as you know, is bigger than 21 states and the District of Columbia put together but we do not get our fair share of Homeland Security dollars. Wisconsin, for example, gets $36 per person. We get about $5 per person. So one of the things I'm trying to work on is the formula 
that's involved in the distribution of these monies to see that more homeland security dollars can come to fund like the Joint Terrorism Task Force of this area as well as uh, other law enforcement functions that can be helpful in protecting you. I've also introduced a comprehensive Seaport Security Act. Uh, we have 40 percent of all of the containers that come into America come into California ports. What if a dirty bomb was in one of those containers and less than 2 percent of them are inspected? So what is happening and what many of us are trying to push is to push our borders out, see that we have customs officials located in other ports, like the port of Hong Kong, for example, which moves out 30,000 containers a day to see that there are high-risk profiles done, that there's x-raying done, so that the United States can guard against um, missiles, dirty bombs uh, coming into this country through containers. Now, as many of you know, I voted to give the president use of force in the war on Iraq. My yes vote was along with 76 other senators, and it was largely due to my position on the Senate Intelligence Committee that enabled me to review the intelligence that led me to believe, as it did three quarters of the United States Senate, that Iraq, in fact, had weapons of mass destruction, biological and chemical, most likely not nuclear, we believed, and had quite possibly deployed them. They were weaponized, they were deployed, and even the commanders had been given the order to use them. I recently reread the classified version of the National Intelligence Estimate. And again, thought with the diagrams, uh, with the locations, my deep consternation that no weapons of mass destruction have been found, despite the fact that our military have visited over a thousand prime sites based on intelligence and has found no traces of either biological or chemical weapons or processes for weapons uh, to be made. I'm not the only one that this has caused a great deal of concern about. Now the question comes, weapons still could be found, catches of anthrax, of plague, of botulinum toxin, of other things still could be found. So the jury is out. But I have a very hard time understanding why the United States does not ask UN weapons inspectors to come back into Iraq to help with this quest. Because this war was sold on the basis of weapons of mass destruction. I don't believe the vote in the Senate would have been nearly what it was if the mission was simply regime change. The vote was what it was because three quarters of the Senate was made to believe that there was an immediate threat to our allies in the region and quite possibly to the United States. So we are in Iraq. So what is the mission? The mission is becoming more complicated and more difficult every day because terrorist operatives from surrounding countries are entering Iraq because there is today being carried out a litany of sabotage against the water system, against the oil system, against the electricity system, with the view to make Americans look bad for wanting to help the people and to force Americans out of that country. I believe we must stay the course. I believe we're there. A provisional government is becoming operative. Um, Paul Bremer is a good administrator. 
we have about 137,000 troops in Iraq, 20,000 in addition from Great Britain, and from all other nations, 11,000. There are not enough in Iraq. And once again, I call upon the administration to involve more nations in the security, in the peacekeeping, in the training of domestic police officers to provide the security for the Iraqi people that's necessary so that the infrastructure can be rebuilt. It's hard to live in a climate of 125 degrees without clean water, without electricity, and the morbidity that it causes to children and even death to children is consequential. Consequently, I strongly believe that the more this administration does to encourage the participation of other countries, the better and the easier it's going to be to do our task and the quicker we're going to be able to bring our men and women home once again. Another place we must stay the course is Afghanistan. It is critical that the government of Hamid Karzai be able to exist and that this fledgling democracy be supported. We know that the Taliban is waiting for us to turn our head. They have regrouped. They are murdering once again. They are committing bombings. They are committing assassinations. And it is critical that the United States stay the course, provide the security throughout uh, Afghanistan so that this fledgling democracy can thrive and grow and stabilize. Now, we have one other real threat, and that's in the Pacific Ocean, and that's North Korea. Over the last several months, North Korea has expelled International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors. It has moved 800, excuse me, 8,000 previously canned plutonium rods into a reprocessing facility. It has restarted its Yongbyon nuclear facility. It has threatened to abandon the armistice uh, with South Korea that has been in effect since 1953. And about 80% of the North Korean army, which is a huge army, 1.1 million soldiers, 80% of that is gathered just a mile north of the DMZ. I was there with General Laporte, our commanding four-star general, in December, and looked out and saw that first ridge, beyond which there are 800,000 troops with enough heavy artillery to rain death and destruction on Seoul on a broad scale. So there are no good military options. Additionally, there are thousands of holes in the ground, bunkers, if you will, where uranium can be refined, where nuclear work can be carried out. And we don't know where this is. Consequently, the art of diplomacy, the art of negotiation, is critical to solving this problem. And whether it be multilateral, or whether it be bilateral, to me, does not make a difference. But having China and Japan and South Korea part of this and putting regional pressure on the North Koreans is critical to make them divest of their nuclear work. And the reason it's so important is, unlike other societies, the N North Koreans have a delivery system for nuclear missiles. It's called the Tapodong, and the Tapodong II uh, can go a long way, but they're in the process of developing a third stage Tapodong missile, which could hit anywhere in the United States. So this isolated government becomes a consequential and real threat if they are allowed to become a nuclear power. So I believe we have to go the extra mile. I believe we've got to strengthen our diplomacy. I believe we've got to find ways to bring this country 
to the table and secure an agreement. Now, shortly after 9-11, the next year, the administration came out with a series of doctrines. One was the doctrine of preemption. We will not wait. If we believe there is a threat, we will attack before they attack us. The doctrine of unilateralism, the United States will move unilaterally, not necessarily wait for others to join us. And there was also put out a position paper called the Nuclear Posture Review. As I read that review, both its classified and unclassified versions, I was quite frankly horror struck. And what I was horror struck by has sort of come home to roost in the Energy Appropriations Bill, where there is $50 million to begin to develop a new generation of battlefield nuclear weapons. Battlefield nuclear weapons, including a nuclear bunker buster. This is extraordinarily serious. The United States of America has the most proficient military in the world by far. We have the most proficient munitions and technological <clears throat> systems for military to use in a conventional sense in the world today. And since the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States has relied on its nuclear arsenal for deterrence only, and thankfully, nuclear weapons have never been used in combat anywhere on Earth. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I grew up during the time we dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiro Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as I grew up, and as others around me grew up, if you asked us what our number one fear was, it would be an atomic bomb. And that's where the DAISY commercial came in that was used a long time ago, because we remember what nuclear bombs do. We remember the radiation. We remember the large-scale suffering and death they caused. And I am telling you, from the depth of all of the knowledge I have gleaned, it is not right for us to reopen the nuclear war. We do not need a new generation of nuclear weapons. We have adequate conventional weapons. And when I go back to Washington, I'm going to do everything I can to get that money removed from the Energy Appropriation Bill. Now, many of you know that there have been two major tax cuts. One in June of 2001, when we had a projected surplus of $5.6 trillion over the next 10 years, and the budget had been in surplus for more than three years. I voted for it because I felt we should give back to the people. And we had the money, it was their taxes, and we should give back to them. Since the recession, since 9-11, since the drop in consumer confidence, since the explosion of corporate scandals, since the international uncertainty, the economy has gone in to a form of recession. And yet this second tax cut was passed. We have a huge federal budget deficit of $401 billion using Social Security trust funds. If the Social Security trust funds were not used to balance the budget, the deficit would be $650 billion. This is extraordinary. And over the next five years, if we keep going the way we're going, the federal government will accumulate $1.9 trillion in new debt. So I think very strongly 
that what I should do to represent you is everything I can to bring this budget back into balance. And this is not going to be easy to do. I have one little pamphlet. I don't know if you have it in front of you. But if you do, it's on the economy. It looks like this. If you just open it to the center for one second, I want to show you one series of pie charts which will give you an idea of what we're up against. On the left, you see a 1993 budget breakdown. Does anybody know what entitlements are in the federal government? Anybody? Social Security, Medicare, Veterans Benefits, Medicaid, Welfare. And they're called entitlements because if you're entitled to them, you get them. You can't cut them in a budget. They are there and they are constantly growing. If you look at 1993, the, 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 these pie charts are in outlays, in other words, what the federal government actually spends a year. You will see we spent 50% of everything that was spent on entitlements. You will see this year we spent 57%. You'll see interest on the debt, you'll see defense, and you'll see every other federal department, justice, interior, education, health, all the other departments, 19%. And then you see entitlement spending in 2013, 65%. If you add interest on the debt, 70% of everything the federal government outlays in 2013 cannot be controlled. That's the dilemma. And most people don't ever speak to this, but it's one of the reasons why we've got to make Medicare more efficient. We've got to have things bid, and we've got to change the Social Security Trust Fund system before it goes belly up as well. So this, I think, is a very definitive document when you talk about the budget to see how extraordinarily difficult it is uh, to make the necessary changes. Ted also mentioned that I have introduced the corollary to Jim Oberstar's um, infrastructure uh, plan uh, called Rebuilding America in the Senate. And what we have done is authorized $50 billion over the next 10 years to build infrastructure. Every billion dollars you spend on transportation is 40,000 40, jobs. It's the biggest thing one can do in terms of priming the pump. And God knows here in California, with the clogged freeways and the gridlock and the inability of people to get from their home to the workplace, this is a prudent expenditure of money. And the way we would fund it is we would crack down on abusive Enron-style tax shelters, and we would prevent American corporations from avoiding paying United States taxes by moving to a foreign country. First, thank you for co-signing the amendment to increase NIH funds in the fiscal year 04 Labor, Health, and Human Services Bill. The question, what do you see as the prognosis for stem cell legislation? Uh, let me take the last part. The, the stem cell legislation, its prognosis is uncertain. I think we have a good opportunity to win that, um, to be able to continue stem cell research. But uh, I do want to say something about cancer. I went to the Senate with a dream, and that dream was that we could end cancer during my lifetime. I've just known so many people, young people, who have died of cancer. So this has been kind of my special health area. And with the human genome, ladies and gentlemen, and with the advances in molecular biology, it is now possible for scientists 
to target drugs just to the bad cancer molecules, molecules. And therefore, the drugs are inordinately effective and there is no toxicity. There's no nausea, your hair doesn't fall out. Um, there's one drug, Gleevec, um, and they've given it to people, it's for myeloid leukemia, they've given it to people in hospice dying Within 12 hours, the disease was reversed and the individuals walked out. It has like a 90% success rate. That's the way to go. And so what I wanted to do was increase the budget so that the present level of research grants could continue to be funded with an emphasis on developing more of these targeted drugs because I truly believe that if we're able to allow science to use what they've learned in molecular biology and through the development of the human genome, that we will be able to see cancer in full remission within my lifetime. And I am not that young, so what a goal that is. And the final question. With California being the economic engine that drives the country, and with California increasingly being labeled anti-business, what new legislation do you believe will improve California's business climate? I think the workman's compensation problem is a real problem. I think it does drive business away. I think we're going to have to make or the state, not me, because I'm in a different area, but they're going to have to make some major changes fast in that system. And one of the thing about deficits is the longer you wait, the more difficult it is. You've got to take action now, not wait for the end of next year when the thing is a billion dollars in the red, but now. And um, so I think these gubernatorial candidates all ought to come up with how they would change the system. I think another thing that may, and I hate to say this because I've been a supporter of family leave, but I think long family paid leave when it is just in California will be a disincentive to businesses uh, to locate here. So workman's comp and I think some changes in the family leave law uh, are really important. Um, I am very bullish on the California economy, and we shouldn't be down about it. What happened, and the economy is really doing quite well all throughout California, except in one area, and it's my home area, and it's the Silicon Valley area, because the Silicon Valley bubble burst in 99, I think it was, capital gain options from about a handful of Silicon Valley companies was 13% of the entire state budget. That's huge. Now that money is all gone. So that's the one place where the economy is not recovering. But we have a very diversified economy in the state. A lot of foreign trade, a lot of service, the largest agricultural state in the union in terms of production. And this economy is in the process of coming back. The one negative is in the employment area. And that's because increasingly companies are what they call outsourcing, sending jobs out of the state or out of the country, and they're downsizing. And those are the two things. Actually, there are more business startups this year. And secondly, the revenues have been coming in in the black this year for the last two quarters. Both of those are very good signs. So be bullish on California. Thank you, Thank you very much, Senator Feinstein. What a great turnout. I am so honored and pleased and this is a great month for you to come together because, as you well know, on August 28, 1963, more than 200,000 Americans joined together 
to march on Washington. They were demanding that our nation make good on its historic pledge of liberty and justice for all people. It was, as one reporter then noted, quote, the greatest assembly for the redress of grievances that this capital has ever seen. At that time, I was a newlywed. You can figure out how old I am, right? I can see it, but you already know that. And I watched all of this unfold on television. And for the people who were there, or the people who watched it on TV, it was a transformational experience because the words of Martin Luther King about his dream and about his vision spoke for so many of us who believe that our nation will only reach its full greatness when every single person is honored and respected and given the chance to rise to his or her full potential. The effects of that march were pretty much immediate and profound. Over the next five years, the legal barriers that separated Americans by race fell one by one. That's the legal barriers. The nation had a new burst of freedom, and people woke up to what was happening in the country. Uh, they woke up to this dynamic civil rights movement. They were mourning the loss of a young president who believed in civil rights, but they turned that into uh, can-do legislation. The comprehensive civil rights bill that passed the year later, by 68 there was equality in our laws demanded in housing, education, employment, voting in public accommodation, and we have more work to do in these areas, but it was an amazing burst of legislation that made great sense. Now clearly we know these laws didn't solve all our problems. We are here quite often uh, getting together to solve those very same problems. But, but we know that it is crucial that the law lead the way. The hearts and minds we know will follow, but the hearts and minds will never follow until the laws are just. Isn't that a fact? So as I think back to those days, I think of why I love my country so much. And I wear my little heart, my red, white, and blue heart. And when you love your country, you want your country to live up to its potential as well. And it's why I remain in this arena, even though, as you well know, as my friend Nancy Pelosi says, it is not for the faint of heart. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. I decided I wanted to do a little exercise of my own, and I would recommend that you, you do this sometime this summer. Just take a pad and a pencil and write down uh, what has made this country great. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to do because it will, will take you to interesting places. And so in my little exercise, this is some of what I came up with, and it is not certainly a completed list, but it's what I wanted to share to, with you today. Uh, what has made our, uh, our land, our America, so great? And I think it does start with the land. Sprawling country that stretches from sea to shining sea, and as the song says, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, uh, we appreciate uh, the legacy of the environment. And here's the great thing. Uh, the environment, up until now, in my view, has been protected in a by partisan way. It was Richard Nixon who created the Environmental Protection Agency, and yet we now have to fight to keep it strong and keep it independent and keep enough people on board to enforce our laws. Um, what else has made our country great in, in, in addition to respecting and, and honoring uh, this environment? Our people make the country great. I look around this room and I see uh, diversity and openness and tolerance and I see brave and energetic people, and, and people with daring, and people who savor uh, new adventures. And I see entrepreneurs who are creating jobs, going where you know a lot of people are afraid to go, and, and researchers finding cures for illnesses that plague our families, and teachers dedicated to our greatest resource, our children. 
and volunteers in all areas of life. Uh, and of course, young men and women putting their lives on the line, their lives on the line for this great nation. Um, those are more of the things that make our country great. And of course, a vibrant economy that, that has created a strong middle class where working people can afford to enjoy the fruits of their labors. And we go back to Henry Ford who said, if I'm going to make this car, I've got to pay people enough, it's got to work right so they can afford to buy the cars that I make. And that was the key to what made this country very different, a working class and a middle class that, is, that has been thriving and has been a vibrant force. Of course, civil rights and making sure that every vote counts. We were tested in Florida on that point, and we have a long way to go on those systems. But we have the full power of the federal government behind that right, because if we're going to be a government of, by, and for the people, then every person has to have that vote count. And it's a crucial thing that has made our nation great. Uh, I have to tell you, when I see the public education system under attack, when I see every story is how bad it is, and yes, there are problems, I want to combat that because I go around the state giving out the Barber Boxer Excellence in Education Awards, and you would not believe the fabulous success stories we have out there. But we have to stay with it. Yes, we need accountability. Yes, we need tests. I'm all for it. But yes, we need to fully fund Leave No Child Behind. Or I'll tell you, the promises that were made to our children simply will not be kept. And I wrote the after school piece there. And I could tell you, uh, kids don't stop learning at 3 o'clock. They need that mentoring after school. We don't want them to go home to an empty house. The FBI tells us that's when the crime goes up. And for the life of me, I don't know why this president decided to cut that budget in half for after school. It's ridiculous when millions of children are waiting. And I will work until I make sure that funding is fully restored. I can promise you that for our children. As I look around the room and I see people with a few gray hairs, it's miraculous. I have never gotten one. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything else but that's been true. Uh, what else has made our country great is an amazing social safety net for our elderly, Social Security and Medicare. And it helps our younger people, too, because the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas are not a burden. They can live their life in dignity. They pay into a system, and they get out what they put in, plus an amount which allows them to live in dignity. And that is under threat. And that is under assault. Uh, something else that has made our nation great, uh, the right to privacy, uh, protecting a woman's right to choose. This is, a, this is a very important tenet of our country because it shows the respect and dignity with which we hold women in our, in our nation. We tell a woman it's between, between you and your doctor and your God, and government will not interfere with that decision in the early stages of a pregnancy. That is Roe v. Wade, and let me tell you, friends, it is hanging by the thinnest, thinnest of threads. So as you look back to everything I have said to you about what has made our country great, and you heard what I said, and you have more things I know that you could add to that list, I want to tell you that I think almost everything that I have mentioned is under fierce attack today in Washington, D.C., and it is one of the reasons I have decided to run again for a third term. I cannot walk away. I cannot walk away when the values that I think unite us here today are under such attack. And after 9-11, as I recall sitting in the Capitol at 9 o'clock in the morning Eastern Time, when those planes went into the World Trade Center, and that plane, Flight 93, might have been headed our way. We're not sure if it was headed to the Capitol or to the White House. I was in the Capitol with 10 colleagues uh, discussing at the very moment, the day, that the administration was going to dip into the Social Security and Medicare trust funds 
to fund the budget. And we were very upset about that. And of course, everything just uh, left the table on that horrible, nightmarish day that has changed our lives. And I said at that time, well, whatever time I have left in the Senate in this term, I will use to make our country strong, to make sure that we do everything I, we can to make our airports safe and our ports safe and protect us from an accident at a chemical plant or a nuclear power plant and make sure that we stay one step ahead of the terrorists. And I was not thinking about anything but that. And then a month later, we got hit with the anthrax attack. And that was in Tom Daschle's office. And I share the vent system with his office. And my whole staff and I went on a Cipro. And we were fine. It was, we did no impact at all. And so I looked at myself and I said, wait a minute. 9-11 and I was in the Capitol and the brave souls on Flight 93 brought that plane down in a field in Pennsylvania. An anthrax attack where that amount of anthrax, they tell us, could have killed two million people if it had been delivered in another fashion. And there I was still walking around um, and still out there. And then I looked at all of these things that I think made our country great that I believe are under fierce attack. And I just put it all together and said, you know, there'll be time later to think about other things. And, and that's what led to my decision uh, to stay in the Senate if, <laughs> a big if, <laughs> that's what the people of the state want. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about priorities because I think it's very important. Um, about three weeks ago, before I left Washington, uh, we had a speaker, uh, Paul Wolfowitz. You know who he is. He is the Assistant Secretary of Defense. And he sat and he was very, um, he was animated. He doesn't often get animated. And he said, Senators, I have to tell you, we need jobs. And I sat up and he said, and we need to get this economy moving again. And I sat straighter. And he said, and we need education system, and we need a health care system, and we need reliable electricity. And by then, I was ready to embrace him, and he said, in Iraq. <laughs> That's what he said, in Iraq. We need all these things in Iraq. And when it was my turn to speak, I said, Mr. Wolfowitz, we need those things in California and in America. How about paying a little attention? To what's going on here at home. And I want to be specific with you, and I'm going to tell you things you can use at a dinner party or at a lunch with your friends, because a lot of people don't know what I'm going to tell you. And that is, when you hear that we're spending $45 billion a year in Iraq, you and I know that's a huge amount of money, but I want you to put it into a context. So I'm going to give you some numbers. The war on drugs. The Drug Enforcement Administration, we spend every year $1.6 billion. We're spending $45 billion a year in Iraq. Higher education, and you know how important that is, we're spending $23.4 billion a year on higher education. We're spending $45 billion in Iraq. After school programs that I talked about, $1 billion a year. Head Start, $6.7 billion a year with millions of kids waiting. Total highway spending. We waste hours in our cars, 31 billion. Transportation security that I talked about. You know I'm fighting to protect our commercial jets by putting a missile defense on them in case a shoulder-fired missile is launched at one of them. This is something that is a harsh possibility. Oh, they can't afford it. To retrofit every single commercial plane, every single one, a million dollars a piece would be seven billion. And that's a one-time expenditure. But no, we can't afford that. Coast Guard protecting us, front lines of terrorism, $6 billion a year. Veterans medical care, where we are now closing hospitals because we can't afford it, $23.9 billion a year. NIH, National Institutes of Health, working to find cures for all the diseases that plague us, heart attacks, stroke, you name it, Alzheimer's. Parkinson's, diabetes, spinal cord injuries, all those diseases, 27 billion a year. And I fought to double that funding, and we were able to double it. 
over many years, but it was a struggle. And total environmental spending, eight billion a year. Eight billion a year. And cleaning up Superfund sites that plague our communities because they have harsh toxins in them and there can be no economic development until they're cleaned up, 1.3 billion a year. Okay, why do I give you these facts? Because I don't want your eyes to glaze over when you hear these numbers. You now have to know that 45 billion a year is a lot of money and this administration and a lot of members of Congress are willing to not even, not even worry about it, but yet they can't fully fund education, environment, cleaning up Superfund, more funds to find cures for diseases, and everything that you care about, suddenly we can't find the funds. And frankly, I think this is where we are today. We need to internationalize the mission in Iraq. We need to bring people in with us. We cannot sustain it alone. We cannot be the only country that takes care of tyrants and terrorism. It won't work. So that's the leadership we need to have right now. And I'm very glad finally to see some voices like Colin Powell talking about this and sounding like he means this because this has to be the wave of the future. Now, we have a lot of other things to talk about. A recall election that is turning our state upside down. And I just want you to think carefully about a couple of things. And, and, and you know, you think it over because there's a little bit of time. If every time an elected official's popularity went down, we had a recall election where there was no crime committed, no high crime, no misdemeanor, but people are unhappy, I can tell you this is a recipe for instability and chaos. And the one thing that I learned when I was an economics major and a stockbroker in a other lifetime was that stability and predictability are the keys to a healthy business climate. And we cannot go down this route. Now, of course, I'm speaking now in a minority view, if you believe the polls. I, uh, I hear that. But you know me, I'm, n I'm not going to shrink away from a controversial point. I want you to think about what it is we are doing here. And I also believe for the people that are going to vote no on the recall because they think as a process this isn't the right way to go, then the logical thing to do on the second part of the ballot is to vote for the person who has been an understudy for the governor in case some disaster strikes, which this would be, and that is our Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante. So I want you to think hard about this strategy and believe me when I tell you the whole country is watching what happens. They're also watching Prop 54, which as you know is this ballot that is going to say we can no longer know who we are. I want to say to Ward Connerly, I'm proud of who we are and I think it's good to know the makeup of our population because just on health care alone, and this is a fact, this could cripple our finding cures for diseases because we know that our differences take shape in various gene differences and various disease differences. And we can now know because we have detailed information that, for example, white women get more breast cancer than, than black women get and Asian women suffer different diseases than white women, and so on down the line. We can learn from this. Why anyone would want to stop that from going forward is beyond belief. And I hope we'll reject this because it doesn't make any sense for us, for our state. And I'm proud to know who we are. I think it's exciting. I think everyone looks to California because of our greatness of diversity, and it's exciting to know uh, who we are and where our future is, is headed. So with all of these controversial things that I've talked about today, I'm sure you have many questions. So let me say in closing, uh, I am exceedingly proud to be here with you. Uh, when Nelson Mandela was trying to awaken his people to throw off the shackles of apartheid, he quoted from a poem, and this is the essence of what he said. And I want you to think about this. 
He said, I know it isn't your weakness that you fear, but your power. And what he meant by that is, we may say we're afraid because we're weak and we can't bring about change, but the truth is, we are strong, particularly in this country of America. We have power to change things for the better. So even though sometimes we're afraid of that power, because maybe we're at a party and somebody says something and you know it's wrong, but gee, I'm not strong enough to, to discuss this. I hope you'll think about what Nelson Mandela told his people. And I hope, because I know how, what leaders you all are in your communities. We've got elected officials here and community leaders here, all of you. And I want you to think about the power that you have to take your well thought out position. Whether you agree with mine or not doesn't matter to me. But to get out there because this is our country, this is our state. It is up to us to make our state and our nation as great as they can be. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. There was a general list of questions, I have quite a few here, that speak about the need for Democrats to speak out more in regard to the activities of the administration. How do Democrats do that and prepare for the next presidential race? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Am I a Democrat? Yes. Okay. Did I speak out? Yes. Could I speak out any stronger than I did? I don't think so. I think for those who are paying attention, they are hearing the message. The message is, we have lost three million jobs in our country. That is the worst record in 90 years. We had a surplus in our country three years ago. As far as the eye could see, it's turned into a deficit as far as the eye could see. We are into these commitments now, taking on our shoulders the tremendous burdens of the world and not really getting enough people to share the burden, and that is further stressing us. And we will not be able to do the things we need to do for our children's education and prescription drugs for our seniors, and making sure that we can, if we have to, uh, give incentives to small business, because those are the, uh, the real producers of the jobs. We will not have the resources at the rate we're going. So I think you're going to hear, as we get in closer to the election, you're going to hear more of a consistent message. We have challenges, but my, I'm very optimistic that we're going to break through. And I'll tell you why, because I believe the people know what's going on in their communities. The people feel the anxiety. I met a guy the other day, he's in retirement, he's doing just fine. He was one of the lucky ones, he didn't have that much in the stock market. So he was okay, he invested in government bonds. He said, you know, my life is great, Barbara, but I'm worried about the world. And I can't even really go out there and, you know, enjoy my life now, because I'm worried about the state of the world. So I think a message is coming forward, and I think you're gonna hear it, and I think that thinking Democrats, Republicans, and independents are going to get that. Thank you very, very much for the chance to be with you.